Alrighty, so our next lightning talk is by uh, Joe Wexler. Um, Joe is a neuroimaging data curator in the Poldrack Lab and Center for Reproducible Neuroscience at Stanford University. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, you may have seen me napping during coffee breaks. I'm a little jet lagged, so bear with, bear with me here. And I'm not great at public speaking, but okay. So my talk is called fMRI Pipelines on HPC with Datalight and Reaperman. Um, so yeah, our goal is, or was to, um, we have, I guess we have now over a thousand fMRI data sets on OpenNeuro, and we're trying to run some pre-processing and quality control software on as many as we can, and then share the, the outputs. Um, the software are very computationally intensive, so we need to do this on an HPC, which we're doing at TAC, which is uh, in Texas at UT Austin. Um, just to kind of give an overview of what the data sets look like, we're using uh, Yoda principles, so we have this DS001 at the top, fMRI prep. That's kind of, that's the main data set, and we have code, a code directory, logs, uh, and then the outputs all in the, at the top level. And then there's a whole separate directory that's outside of all this called the work directory. And that can be deleted after the fact, but that's, that's used during, uh, during the processing. And if, the, and if you need to debug or if it failed or didn't complete, you need to uh, keep that around. And it's huge and it generates like millions of files. So the problem, was that we want to use Datalad, as you all know, it's great for recording provenance, reproducibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and parallel processing with Datalad is hard. Um, this was back in 2020 when we um, were coming up with this uh, workflow. Um, yeah, basically you need to have a Datalad run command uh, for each sub job that you want to run in parallel um, if you want to record the provenance of each sub job, uh, but having those run simultaneously creates concurrency issues. So you could, uh, one data lad run job might pollute the working directory and can prevent other jobs from, from starting. So yeah, the solution that we went with was repro man, which is a Python package. Um, and with a single repro man run command, um, you can include, as I've shown there, you can include a bunch of different job parameters, so the, the name of the job, um, what queue you want it to be in, things like that. Um, and it will generate a, a parallel job submission script. In our case, we're using Slurm, and we'll submit the job for you. It's just like Datalad containers run, it's compatible with um, a repository of singularity containers, which we're using repronym slash containers, which is great for recording provenance and reproducibility. And then it will save the metadata in your data set in a dot reaper man directory. Um, so it'll save the submission script, the run script, uh, the date and time of job submission. And then for each of the sub jobs, the command that you use to run the software, logs, exit codes, some other things too. So that, was, that worked great for us. It basically solved our, our problem. Um, and then it also had some other, uh, one feature in particular that proved to be really useful because um, we ran into some other kind of unrelated problems. Um, so the, the, the feature is the, the cleanup script. Basically, each of the sub jobs, um, when they complete, they kind, of, they kind of figure out if they were the first sub job to complete. And if they were, they'll, they'll designate themselves like the, the job, the, a particular task where that first one to complete will wait for all the other ones to complete, and at that time we'll do some sort of cleanup activity for the entire job, not just for one sub job. So, uh, one, some built-in features that utilize that are the data lads. You can data lad save on the compute node rather than having to do that after the fact, uh, which was when we have like gigantic outputs with you know lots of files. Um, like there wasn't even enough memory sometimes to data lad save on the login node, so that was quite useful for us. You can copy back data at the end of a job. And then we also added some um, 
kind of custom features to that cleanup script to solve some of our other problems. So for example, um, the first one was a simple algorithm to prevent waste in compute time. So it, I don't know how this works on other HPCs, but on TAC, if you submit a job with 50 nodes and all of them complete except for one node, well, let's say they all complete in five hours and except for one node takes 20 hours, you're paying for all 50 nodes for 20 hours. So we use this uh, cleanup script. To, we modified it so rather than just that for the first sub job to complete, rather than waiting for all the rest of them to complete, you, it'll wait, say, for 80% of the sub jobs to complete. And then it'll give it maybe 25% extra time from that current elapsed time and then clean up. And then maybe you had one or two that did, didn't complete. You can run those separately with one or two nodes after the fact. Um, second feature that we added was copying work directories back conditional upon subjob failure. Got it. Thanks. Um, so problem we ran into, which we are quite proud of, we got suspended from TAC several times because we were storing a total of greater than 15 million files on the Scratch file system, um, which I think may have been a record. So our solution was, um, well, it was kind of a multi-part solution, but one part of it that utilized this feature was um, to have the, the, the cleanup script at the end of the job run text efficient tool for copying back data, but only for failed or incomplete subjobs. So that way we could be storing all these work directories on the node temp storage, and then only copying back the ones that we need to copy back in case we need to debug or, or rerun. So conclusion, um, yeah, this was back in 2020 that we developed this. I know that people have, other people have found other solutions, and I think the next talk is actually related to this. So there's fairly big processing workflow, the script, the way, things like that. I haven't checked these out too much yet. I've been meaning to. Um, but yeah, if anyone has been working on similar issues or wants to talk, feel free to reach out. And here are some links. So thank you all for listening. All right, we have time for one or two questions. All right. Oh, there's one. Okay. Hi. It's actually the same question that I already posed, but 15 million files, that doesn't seem a lot. Uh, I mean, it, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem astronomically a lot for a center like tech and uh, file systems like uh, ZFS, uh, they deal with just checked two to, to the 48 uh, I nodes or actually entries per directory. And that's nothing compared to that. Uh, I wonder how, how it comes that so many people here in this room are having problems with uh, number of files. That is something that has been technically addressed already many, many years ago, and only legacy file systems have a problem with. I mean, and just an, uh, something that I, I occurred to notice, uh, that I find it fascinating, that you have so much power and still stumble upon something so trivial. I mean, not yeah. you. I mean, the yeah, people yeah. giving you the systems. Yeah. Chris, do, do you remember why that was? was it, did it have to do with the particular type of file system or something? So they're using a luster file system. The primary uh, use case they had when building the entire cluster is just very compute heavy, low I.O. Um, and so they're basically set up for massive MPI jobs, not workflows that create millions of files per minute. Um, and this is, and the amount and size of the files we were using uh, meant we could not use the local storage, which totally would handle this. Uh, so we were using the network storage. So it's actually an I.O. problem over the network, not like a file system capability per se. Makes sense. Thanks. OK, uh, is there one more question? Otherwise, we have the panel later. All righty. OK. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.